Okay, welcome back to Learn SDR with Prof. Jason. Now we're gonna talk about symbol timing synchronization or sometimes called clock recovery. And the problem we're trying to solve here is that the clocks that produce the symbols and that produce the samples, which in the transmitter are the ones that get sent to the digital to analog converter, and in the receiver are the ones that get sent from the analog to digital converter, the places where that sampling happens and which sample happens to be the peak of the symbol, which in binary phase shift keying should correspond to either a plus or minus one. Those clocks are not running at the same frequency. And even if they were running at the same frequency, you turn on the pieces of hardware at different times and they have different phase offsets. And if you were to walk toward or away from the, the transmitter uh, just by the speed of light delay, you would end up offsetting, offsetting the clocks. So the the, the different turn on time and the different delays mean that these are never going to be in phase. So the goal here is to figure out how, how do we figure out how to sample right at the center of the symbol, or at least interpolate to where the exact center of that symbol is, right where it's, uh, right where it's passing through plus one or minus one. And, and how do we keep track of these drifting clocks? Because even if we determine it for one instant, as you move around or as the temperature of the clocks drifts a little bit, uh, things are going to fall back out of sync. So we need to synchronize two hardware clocks. But we don't have a separate clock that we're transmitting. We're just doing it from the data itself. So maybe back in the analog days, you would actually uh, use some of the techniques I'll talk about and nudge around some analog clocks to physically do sampling at different times. But we're not going to do that. We're going to do all our post-processing in software using digital signal processing. And if we are to believe the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, as long as we're sampling fast enough, we have all the information you could ever have about a signal whose bandwidth is limited to within a, a full complex bandwidth of less than our sampling rate. So what we have to do now is we have to extract the, mod, extract the clock from our, our modulated random looking data, plus all the noise that gets picked up from the transmitter to the receiver. So, how does that work? Well, let me just show you what we, where we left off last time. So I'm gonna share my screen. And this is the flow graph that we had last time. We are transmitting random bits through a binary phase shift keyed constellation modulator. And that goes out to a Pluto sync on our RTLSDR receiver. We are multiplying that by an offset, although we don't have to do that uh, anymore because now we're passing it through a anal uh, automatic gain controller, which sets the level to be uh, roughly plus or minus one. And through this FLL band, fil band edge filter, which automatically applies any offset to the carrier frequency to get it roughly in the right, right range roughly centered around zero, so that we're, we're effectively tuning our radio to the center of uh, where, where the receiver thinks the transmitter is transmitting. In order to actually capture the, the timing, we have to pass it through a second root raised cosine filter. This is the matched filter. And it's the output of this filter that should, should be our symbols. So let me, let me play that and remind you where we stand. So this is the data we're transmitting. It's all real, no imaginary. It's a spectrum of our data. This is what is received raw by the RTL-SDR. I could bump up the gain a little bit if I wanted. That's just gonna get compensated by the automatic gain controller, but I might as well take up more of the range of the uh, analog to digital converter. Now this offset knob doesn't do anything anymore because I have my, my FLL band edge filter. They give me a pretty nice version of this with the overall carrier phase offset mostly removed. And what I have left are these eye diagrams where let me pause them. So stop, uh, let me start again and stop it at a different place. Ah, that's, that's all right. Now let me show the samples here. So the samples for the real part are those and the samples for the imaginary part are uh, circles, there we go. And what we wanna do is we want to recover the perfect place for sampling. So even though you might think that we wanna get rid of this residual 
uh, carrier phase offset. We'll actually do that next. And we'll I'll explain next time why that's why that's the best thing to do. But we have two eye diagrams here. One is for the imaginary part, and one is for the real part. And of course, these slosh back and forth as the as the uh, since we still do have a little bit of frequency offset. We're never going to get these perfect. But here, for example, most of the the power happens to be in the real part. And you can see where this eye diagram comes together. And it should be right about here where we should sample to get, uh, to get either a plus one or a minus one out of, this, uh, out of this waveform. And all of these lines here are transitions from, uh, from, from some past data on into the current data. So all these on top are probably coming from a previous bit that was a plus one. And all the ones on the bottom are coming from a previous bit that was a plus one down to a current bit that's a minus one. And same thing here, you can actually see the paths a little bit better here. All these paths go from a minus one up to a plus one. And the different trajectories they take have to do with what's gone on even in the further past. Because again, each, each symbol is actually extends out quite a bit. It's just that only, only at the next symbol uh, does its influence go away. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna concentrate on this eye diagram and figure out what we can do with it to really pick out the, the correct symbol. And right here, we're actually pretty good. There is, there is a sample that looks like the right sample, but that's not always true. If I start this and let it drift, you can see that the, the correct place to sample is slowly drifting, even though I'm really taking every, uh, well, I'm, I'm basically taking two symbols worth of samples. My clock isn't quite right because the best place is slowly moving. See if I can stop it at some different places and demonstrate where we might need some interpolation. I kind of have an extreme example here where I actually have 16 samples per symbol. You really only need two. And if I do that, then we definitely need to interpolate between these samples. I'm just showing all these samples for kind of illustrative purposes. So these eye diagrams are a little bit more clear. All right, so let's, let's talk about how, how this could work. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna draw one of these eye diagrams. So, let me draw, uh, this is time here. And let me put down, here is a place where we should expect a symbol to happen. Here's, a, let's call that uh, maybe time zero. Here's a time minus T symbol before where we expect another symbol to happen. And here's a time plus T after where we expect another symbol to happen. So let me kind of draw, draw some symbols here. This is a plus one or a minus one. And here we'll either get a plus one or a minus one. And here we'll either get a plus one or a minus one. And this is with no noise. And as we saw, there are plenty of transitions from the, the plus one here to the plus one here, sort of many different ways of going from there to there, depending on what happened in the past. Same thing here, many different ways to go from minus one to minus one. There are many different ways to go to change, to go from uh, uh, minus one to plus one and plus one to minus one. And the same thing here, many different ways to, to stay at one, depending on what's gonna happen before and after, many different ways to transition down, many different ways to transition up, and many different ways to stay the same. And the tighter you make your excess bandwidth, the, the lower you make it, the closer you get to that ideal boxcar, uh, the more craziness happens in the middle here. The, the samples, uh, the, the waveforms in between uh, really deviate from the kind of the direct path. But again, on top of this, there'll always be noise that gets added from, from, your, uh, from your transmitter. So right now I've sort of drawn the continuous case, but we're gonna sample it. Let's imagine two different cases. One, one case we sample it a little bit early. So let's say that our, we think that our ideal place to sample it is, is back here somewhere. So let me, let me call this the, uh, the early case. And let's also imagine that maybe we think that we should have been sampling it here. Let me call this the late case. Now, what, can we, what properties can we use about this? Well, it turns out that the maximum likelihood thing to use is to look at the slope, the slope of these transitions. So if you're going from a plus one to a plus one, there's not much you could do. But if you're changing, if you're going from a minus one to a plus one, there's some slope here. And this slope tends to be, all these slopes tend to be positive. And so uh, that looks good. 
And if you're going from a plus one to a minus one, all these slopes here tend to be negative. So you can't just use the slope, right? That, that wouldn't give you any information. But if we know the slope and we also know the, the bit itself, so oh, and these, these slopes happen to be zero, but that's okay. That doesn't give us any information. But we know not just the slope, but we know the, the sample itself. And here the slopes are positive and all the values are positive. And here the slopes are all are negative, but the values are all negative. And again, here the slopes are all zero. We don't get much information, but and the values are negative. And so if we multiply the slope by the, the value, we're either going to get no information in the case of no transition, or information that tells us that we're uh, that we're a little bit early if we're positive, and a negative times a negative is going to be positive. So if we get a on average, a, a positive value of our of our data times our slope. So this is our. Let me just be a little bit more formal. Is our error signal is going to be our data times our time derivative here, our slope. Uh, if this is positive, we know we're a little bit early, and if it's negative, we know we're a little bit late. So let me just go through the cases there. So in the case where there's no transition, uh, we basically have zero slope and nothing interesting happens. If we do have a transition going from minus one to plus one here. Um, we either have positive slopes. Positive slopes times a negative number gives us a negative number. So we know we're a little bit late. So let's, let's say e, e is less than zero. And in this case, E is bigger than zero. And here we have positive values, values that are above zero, but uh, a negative slope. So as long as we have transitions, no matter which direction the transitions go, we can tell whether we're sampling a little bit early or a little bit late. And uh, note that we need data that has transitions. So if you just send a whole bunch of zeros or send a whole bunch of ones for a really long time, you're not going to be able to, to, to do this, uh, this timing synchronization. You need data with transitions. And you could artificially introduce transitions into your data by, uh, for example, uh, XORing it with a known kind of pseudo random pattern that you then take out at the end, or uh, just guaranteeing that every few bits you, you transition and reading your data and knowing that you have to undo that. So what we want is we want an error signal that's either the, the, the value of the data itself times the, the slope, or sometimes we use, we don't just use the value, we actually imagine having done this decoding, we say, well, we're sampling here. Anything above the, the axis should, should be treated as a, as a plus one, and anything below the axis should be treated as a minus one. We could say that uh, another, another error signal could be the sign of x times the derivative. And this will give us, uh, this will give us uh, a decision-directed error signal. OK, so what, what do these look like if I'm not just early by a fixed amount or late by a fixed amount, but I plot as a function of how far I'm off? So as a function of delta t, let's say that this is delta t here, as a function of how far I'm off from the, the, uh, the ideal sam sample, uh, what, what does this, this error signal look like? So for any given any given uh, symbol that I'm transmitting or any given transition, it's, it's going to look a little bit different. But I can imagine doing this over and over and over again thousands and thousands of times and taking the average. So what I actually plot, want to plot is the average error as, uh, as a function of, of how far off I am. So if I'm right on, if I'm, if I'm sampling correctly, I have zero slope because these all these transitions are nice, nice, uh, nice humps here. I have zero slope, so zero times anything is going to be zero. I saw that if I'm a little bit low, I'm going to have positive error signal, and actually you can work out that as you go a little bit further from zero, uh, as long as you're kind of close, it actually goes up pretty linearly, and if I'm a little bit high here. Uh, if I'm a little bit late, I'm going to have a negative 
negative error si signal on average. And once you start to get about, uh, well, I, I, go, I go further and further out, this is gonna eventually kind of, this error is gonna maximize and come down. Let me draw this, let me extend this a little bit further. It's gonna maximize and come down. And it's actually gonna come back up as I get closer and closer to this previous symbol. So, you know, being, being really late is like, or sorry, being really early is like being a little bit late for the previous one. And the same thing happens over here. And what I want is I want a control loop like I had before that tries to lock on to this zero. And if I'm a certain distance away from, from delta t being zero, I, I know roughly how far I have to go to get to the right, right place. And I might not actually have a symbol that's, that's right there. I might have to interpolate between two or more symbols. And so that's, that's, what I'll, that's what I'll do. And this error signal is very noisy because transition by transition, it's gonna be a little bit different. But again, I'll do the same thing I did with the frequency lock loop. I'll smooth out this error signal with some low pass filter basically. And I'll use that to nudge around where I think the optimal sampling time is. All right, so there's some, I'll show you the block that does all of that, but let me, let me just first say some, some technical things before the, the block itself makes sense. And, and this, oh, this, this plot of the error here is called the S-curve, S-curve. And what this means is that if this, is, if this error is positive, I want to nudge myself in that direction. And if the error is negative, I want to nudge myself back in that direction. And of course, if my error is too far, I end up just locking on to the, the previous sample, which is fine too. Okay, so there are three questions you might have. The first is, how do we actually compute this derivative when we're only given sparse samples? So in my Example that I showed, I were doing 16 samples per symbol, but that's, that's way more samples than we need. You can get by with two or, or four often. Uh, so how do you compute the derivative? Um, given that you can get by with only two or four, how do you interpolate to the, the right spot and timing? And finally, the last thing that might be in the back of your head is there's still this sort of sloshing back and forth between the real and the imaginary part. How, how do we deal with that? And so let me just answer, answer all three of those questions before we actually show the, the block that does this. So the, the, first, the first answer is, well, where did we get X? So, so basically X is the thing that I drew the, the, the eye diagram of. And X came by taking our received signal, our received signal and filtering it with a root raised cosine pulse. So, so this is our, our received signal. So our Rx signal, and this is our root raised cosine filter. So it, it has this, this nice shape that we saw last time. So what does P look like? P has this peak and then the zero crossings at, at the next, here's the next symbol and the symbol after that and the previous symbol and the symbol after that. So that, that's what P looks like. And for people of, taking signal processing stuff, this operation is a, is a convolution operation. We're taking our received signal and involving it with a filter that looks like this pulse. And this goes on and on for a while. So what we really want is we want X prime. And there's a couple of ways of doing that. One is to take X and to convolve it with a filter that calculates the derivative. So you can do this by taking, for example, um, finite differences. So that's one approximation to the derivative. You take, you take the next sample and you subtract the previous sample and that's an approximation to the derivative. There are better and better approximations if you're willing to give yourself more and more samples to work with. Um, let me just write this as R involved with P. So this is our X involved with D. 
And let me just move the parentheses around. So this filtering operation is associative. So I could have just taken my received signal and convolved it with my pulse passed through a derivative filter. So this is basically convolving my received signal with the derivative of this pulse. So what does that look like? Well, imagine it starts here at zero and it goes down and here a little bit less than zero. Uh, the derivative is positive. You can imagine uh, drawing what this derivative looks like. So uh, it passes, passes through zero right here and sort of does this. Passes through zero right here. So, you know, the derivative looks something like this. So I can call this um, P prime as my derivative. So one way to compute the derivative is to pass it through a, a derivative, uh, to pass my received signal through this P dot filter. Maybe I should call this P dot, since this is called the time derivative here. P dot filter. Uh, and if we know what P is, we can analytically compute this once. So that's, that's the first question. The second question is, if I have a few samples, if I only have two or, or four samples, I'm going to have to interpolate to find the right point. And like I said, Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem says that all the information is there. As long as my signal is band limited and I have, I've sampled fast enough, I know exactly what that signal, signal looks like, and I should be able to analytically compute what it looks like in between samples and use that. So there are three ways of doing that. Um, one way of doing it is to interpolate to some, some fractional sample. So you can use piecewise polynomials. I think that was a, that was a common choice. Uh, we're, we're not going to do it that way. There's a second method, which is kind of inspired by what I, what I showed you in my sampling lecture. So how do you fill in the samples in between? Well, one way of doing it is to upsample the signal. And to do that, you just take each sample and add a bunch of zeros. So if you want to upsample it by a factor of 10, you take the sample and then add, a, add, tens, or add nine zeros. And then you take the next sample and add nine zeros. And then you pass that very spiky signal through a low pass filter with the right cutoff. And that exactly interpolates the samples that would have been in between. So, so for example, you can upsample by a large factor like 32 and then apply your, your uh, upsampled version of your P filter and upsampled version of your P derivative filter. And uh, now, now you have a lot of samples per simple and you can, you can search for the best, the best one of those. And with so many symbols or so many samples per simple, you're gonna find one that's, that's close enough. It's certainly within the noise and even within the, the errors you would get from the analog to digital conversion process if you, if you pick a big enough upsample. So that's, that's really computationally expensive because you're basically doing this at a rate that's 32 or 64 or 100 times as fast as, as you need in the end. Because at the end of the day, you just want to pick out the, the symbols. Uh, you, you want to just pick out the samples right at the, the peak of the symbol. So, so there's a, a more efficient method, which basically has the same effect. If you only care about one output every 32 samples, for example, you can pre-compute what it would be like to have upsampled by a large factor and apply these filters and uh, then downsample, keep only every, every uh, 30 second sample. And that doesn't give you all the samples in between. So you can, if you do all this pre-computing, pre what you end up with is a bank of say 32 filters, each of which acts like a shifted version of this output. And then you, uh, you don't have to compute all of, the, all of the outputs of that bank of filter. You only need to pick one filter and say, well, I'm going to ask, is this my right sample, right sample point? I'll compute my error. And 
if my error is a little bit, uh, tells me I'm a little bit early, I'll just march to a later filter in that filter bank. And if the error tells me I'm a little bit late, I'll march the other way. And depending on how big this sort of smoothed out error signal is, I can, I can march, uh, march more or less. And there's another feedback loop here that will eventually land me on the right filter in that filter bank. And that was a, a lot of words, but the, the name for all of this is called a polyphase filter bank. And that's, that's what we're going to use when, when we, uh, when we uh, put down the, the symbol synchronization block. We'll, we'll use a uh, synchronization and we'll choose the polyphase filter bank. Um, and the, for the last problem, like what, what about this residual sort of slow moving between the real and the imaginary part? I'll, I'll talk about that after I do the, the next demo. So let me show you what this simple synchronization block looks like. All right, so I'm gonna start basically where I left off, but I will reveal a little bit more of this flow graph that I've pre-computed. So again, we're transmitting binary phase shift keyed data with an alpha of 0.5 into my Pluto sync. I'm receiving it on my RTL-SDR source. Um, I could manually offset the frequency, but I don't have to because I have this, this band edge filter. And instead of passing it through a raised cosine filter and looking at the output, I'm gonna pass it through this simple synchronization block. And in order to use this, I need a couple things. So if I look at the parameters of the simple synchronization block, I have many options here. I could choose uh, different timing error detectors, zero crossing detector or a Gardner detector. These are different timing error detectors that you can look up. The one I described was the YY prime maximum likelihood detector or the sign of Y, Y prime maximum likelihood detector. So e either one of these is gonna give you similar results. Uh, that's, that's the one we'll use. Um, you have to give it the samples per symbol, which in this case is the unusually high value of 16. Um, the expected timing error detector gain. So this is a parameter that I'm just gonna leave as the default, even though this is probably incorrect. This is some analytic or simulated expression that you have to, you have to, to do. Uh, and it's basically that S curve that I showed. It's the slope of the S curve at the origin. And so this is something that could be calculated or simulated. Uh, loop bandwidth is, again, something I'm gonna leave as default. This is how all the little error signals I get by being a little bit earlier, a little bit late, I have to smooth those all out. And the lower I make this bandwidth, the more aggressive it smooths things out. But that means the slower it can pick up on real timing changes. Uh, the default is fine for, for this example. Uh, damping factor of one makes this smoothing out process a critically damp loop. Maximum deviation. So this is how far uh, it will be allowed to go in, in the timing recovery. So we don't, if we're sending in no signal, we don't just want the timing to go all over the place. So the timing knows that there should be about SPS samples per signal, sa samples per symbol, and we'll, we'll go up by uh, one and a half samples or down by one and a half symbol, samples. Uh, I think it's one and a half symbols, down by one and a half symbols. Okay. Um, and the output samples per symbol. So this is how many of those polyphase filter bank taps I actually use at any given time. And so the, the default and a pretty common choice is one. I just want the one right where the symbol is. So we'll start with that. Um, and then we need a way of interpolating. And there are different options here. There's a MMSE filter, there's a polybank filter MSE. We're gonna use this polybank filter, uh, po sorry, polyphase filter um, matched filter. So what this does is you, you pass it in some parameters and it actually computes both X and X dot. It does the root raised cosine filter to, to compute your, uh, your proper raised cosine symbols. And it also computes the derivative of that and, and uh, uses the derivative to select which, which filter it should use. All right, so I'll put these in as parameters. So you need end filts, which is the number of number of uh, polyphase filter 
filters and or number of arms of this polyphase filter, basically the number of different uh, subsamples that it can compute. And again, it sort of pre-computes all these filters and chooses one or the other. Uh, and then finally, this is the one that's the most complicated is root raised cosine taps. So I have to, I have to pass it in an actual filter. And so we need to construct these taps. So right now these are variables. I'll show you where these come from in a second. So I will choose 32 arms of my polyphase filter. I think that's that's a pretty pretty reasonable choice. Sometimes 128 if you uh, need need more fine grained timing. And this root raised cosine taps will will be made by this root raised cosine filter taps block. So this is just defining this variable and doing nothing else. And if I look in here, um, this is pretty tricky. I, I spent some time working, you know, making sure I had all these parameters right. There was a bug that, that took me some time to figure out. But um, if you want to use this simple sync block with this match filter, uh, you have to pass the parameters that look like this. So the gain is the number of filters. The sample rate is number of filters times the sample rate. So this is, again, we're kind of effectively upsampling by a factor of 32 here, upsampling and then downsampling again. But we're combining those operations of upsampling, filtering with some offset and downsampling uh, into a particular sample. So in order to pass it the rate, uh, when it makes a root raised cosine filter, it's effectively happening at this upsampled rate. So that's, that's why you have to do n filts times sample rate. Symbol rate is the sample rate divided by the samples per symbol, but not multiplied by the number of filters. Of course, it needs to know our excess bandwidth parameter, alpha, which in this case is 0.5, and the number of taps. So this is the, the number of taps in this, in this really big filter that, that will get uh, divided up into a bunch of little filters, one of which we will choose as the one that gives us the, the best sample. And 11 samples per symbol times the number of filters, this gives us a filter that spans 11 symbols. So this is sort of five symbols on either side of our, our, our main symbol. And that's enough with reasonable values of alpha to, to capture all possible uh, ways of, of getting to here from there. So these are kind of standard defaults that, that uh, uh, I haven't tweaked very much of, okay? So out of this block, and this block does a lot, comes a couple things. Some, some diagnostic stuff, which we'll look at. The actual timing error, which I'll plot on a, on a time sync. Instantaneous guess at the sample time. So this will be, this will move around a lot. And then this sort of smoothed out long-term average. All right, that's sort of diagnostic information that you don't need to plot. But what, what actually comes out is a samples of the, the symbols at the right timing instant. So let's plot that. Uh, let's look at it on an eye diagram, although that's not going to be very interesting for just uh, putting one sample per symbol. And let's look at that on a constellation sync. So uh, let's, let me see, what do I have missing here? Oh, there's one thing that I'm missing. So I'm going to connect this FL bandage filter to this simple sync block. And I think this is kind of optional, but I have found that before the big deviation of carrier uh, frequency has been synchronized with this FLL block, but basically before this block has settled, the symbol sync block kind of goes all over the place. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delay the, the signal acquisition until that has settled. So this is a, a bit of a cheat, just sort of for debugging purposes, I'm gonna skip the first million or so samples. So at our sample rate of one megahertz, I am skipping that. So I'm skipping basically the first seconds worth of stuff. And that just allows the, the tuning to, to settle in. All right, so uh, that's what I'm sending here. Now, let me point out here that if we choose to use this polyphase filter bank with the matched filter, we don't have to do a second matched filter. The, the block itself does the matched filter. So I don't have to use this second root raised cosine filter like I did up here to show the output. If you were to choose a different interpolating filter and a, or a different timing error detector, you probably do need to explicitly use the second root raised cosine filter to, because the block will not do that. 
Uh, it's only because I've constructed this long, uh, long filter whose taps will be manipulated to, to make the different polyphase arms that I need this. All right, so, and, and this stuff is, is basically for next time, but I'll show a, a preview at the end. So let's play this. And let's see what comes out here. So all the, the top stuff is all the same. Uh, my block has pretty much tuned things. Um, this is the output of my, uh, my, uh, my frequency lock loop. This is the timing, the eye diagrams that we saw before. And now this is the new stuff. This is what comes out of my symbol sync block. And it looks like samples that if I were to show, I don't know why I didn't do this before. Let me show circles here. Uh, let me show markers on the real and the imaginary part. And let me pause it. This really does look like I'm getting roughly one sample per symbol out. And if we happen to be aligned so that the imaginary part is, is roughly zero, the real part really does contain either plus ones or a bunch of minus ones, plus ones, minus one, plus one, minus one. So this looks like we're doing pretty well up to this further slow sloshing back and forth between real and imaginary. And we can see that in two ways. If I put markers on my eye diagrams here, oops, uh, markers on my eye diagrams, uh, markers on my eye diagrams, um, there's a little bit of sloshing back and forth because of this, uh, this residual phase offset. Um, but if we plot the, the constellation plot, you know, basically the uh, real and imaginary axes here, you can see that all of these symbols here come out on the unit circle. So what that tells us is that we've got, uh, we really are sampling uh, places that are supposed to be plus one or minus one rotated by some residual phase offset which we'll correct next. So let's look at the, the various error terms that this thing spits out. So the first thing that happens is it, it computes an, an error and that error is really noisy. It kind of goes all over the place, but once it's locked, the error averages to be zero. And then finally down here, uh, we're computing the instantaneous value that it thinks the, the timing should be. And so, uh, nominally, the clocks are 16 samples per symbol, and it seems that this red line here, which is the kind of long-term average of, of all these little instantaneous estimates, that's pretty close to 16. Now, it's not going to be exactly 16. Let me see if I can zoom in. It's not going to be exactly 16 because the clocks are ever so slightly different, but it's going to be really close to 16. And uh, that gives us an estimate for how far off the clocks actually are. All right. So it's still not quite satisfying because we haven't gotten rid of this residual phase difference. And that's what I'm gonna talk about next time. But let me just give you a little preview. The thing that does that is called a Costas loop. So let me enable that. And then let me enable the same two things, the, the eye diagram and the constellation sync for that and show you what, what that looks like. So my constellation sync, I'm showing both the stuff that comes out of the symbol sync block and the Costas loop. And here, stuff that comes out of the Costas loop, it really has eliminated that residual phase difference. The imaginary part really is zero. And all of my data really is uh, in the real part. And uh, after my Costas loop, my little red points are all plus one or minus one. And I don't know why I didn't show a time plot of this. Let me just copy this and show that. All right, so way down here at the end, uh, especially if I turn on my, my real markers, we see pretty much the data that we put in, uh, ones and zeros. Let me stop that and look. So we see these transitions between one, plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the imaginary part has, has pretty much been, been uh, set to zero. All right, so we'll talk about how how that final uh, final loop works. But 
before I do that, let me just answer the last of the three questions which, which might be on your mind, which is if I have a signal that's not all real, if it's sort of doing this, like sloshing back and forth between, uh, between real and imaginary parts, or more importantly, if I use a different constellation like QPSK, which really has completely independent data streams in the real and the imaginary components, what I want to show is that some version of this is independent of any residual mixing that might be present. So let me, let me just write, uh, write this last little bit here, show you that we can come up with a version of this timing error detector that works uh, for, for residual offsets or uh, something like QPSK where you have independent X and Y streams. So, so our signal, signal, I'll write it as the complex number Z. This is really equal to some X, the, the stream that happens in the, the real component plus IY, the random stream of data that happens in the imaginary component. And for QPSK, these are just independent. Um, for the binary phase shift keying, this imaginary part was always zero. But what we want, want is an error signal that takes into account both timing errors in X, so X, X dot, plus timing errors in Y, Y, Y dot. Let me show you how, how this could work. And we, want, and we want this to happen even if we have some overall rotation. So even, even if Z goes to Z times E to the I phi. So we've multiplied Z by some purely, uh, some pure phase that just rotates everything in the complex plane. Let's, let's just make sure that we can still do our timing recovery. So, so one thing that is invariant under this kind of rotation, as long as it really is a constant or a slow moving offset, is, is to look at Z star, the complex conjugate, times Z dot. So again, as long as the, the phase offset is relatively constant symbol by symbol, as long as we've already eliminated the majority of the, the sloshing around, um, this, this assumption pretty much holds. What does this look like? Well, this is just Z star, X minus I, Y, and Z dot, which is X, oops, can't speak and write at the same time, X dot, X dot plus I, Y dot. All right, so when we multiply this out, what do we get? Well, we get a real part that is X, X dot, and the other real part happens when these second terms multiply. So minus I times plus I gives me plus one, plus, so this gives me plus Y, Y dot. Well, that looks promising. That's exactly the error term we want, plus imaginary stuff, which is what? Well, X, Y dot minus Y, X dot. So the real part of this is the term we want. So let me actually set my, my error term equal to the real part of this, Z star Z dot. And if Z star Z dot is invariant to any slow uh, rotations in this, in this phase offset, uh, residual phase rotations, then the real part is also invariant under these residual rotations. So I can lock on to a signal, even if there is some, some, uh, some phase rotation, even, uh, that's, even if it's slowly moving. I'm just sort of computing this symbol by symbol, and the error in timing is going to be invariant under any particular phase offset. Uh, if I'm really off in frequency, you know, for example, if I didn't have my frequency locked loop, then I wouldn't be able to just take the derivative like this. The derivative would also uh, end up being affected by some really fast, uh, fast rotating phase. Okay, so wh where does this residual phase shift come from? This comes from the fact that the frequency lock loop doesn't perfectly lock on. And also, even if it did perfectly lock on to the right frequency by adjusting the, the, the scales to be exactly balanced, 
it's never going to know exactly the right phase to lock onto uh, with, with that technique of balancing the scales. So same thing if by hand, if I slid the slider back and forth and I happen to exactly match the frequency offset, um, I would end up with some, some arbitrary phase rotation that wouldn't be, wouldn't be spinning, wouldn't be uh, sloshing back and forth between real and imaginary, but it would be, it would be constant. So uh, the, the frequency lock loop itself only does so well in, in balancing the, the frequencies to, to get you to eliminate the tuning offset. But even when you eliminate the tuning offset, you have to, you have, to have your, local, your local clock running at exactly the right phase in order to align the, the symbols to be on, on plus and minus one as opposed to being a little bit rotated off one way or the other. And we'll see that next time. I can't tell if I write on a diagonal or if the camera is slightly diagonal. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>